Uh, Lord, we thank you this afternoon. We glorify your name because of that which you have done, that which you have promised to do. To you in the earth today, in the lives of your children, believers. Thank you, Father Lord. We revenge your name. We glorify you. Lord, uh, we cannot be boastful or just taking a little from your heart to deliver into the hearts of your people so that your spirit will cause it to be enlarged. So, Lord, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Make my tongue as a pen of the ready writer. I can write upon the hearts of your people that which you desire for them to have. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Please, I would like for us to, I would like for us to, um, at this time, um, I don't know whether we can share these messages. We can also share these messages um, to friends, relatives, uh, you can share. I believe we should be able to share it, but since it's a closed group, I don't know whether the setting will allow for the sharing uh, one way or the other. Um, so because I want many more people to see, listen, but they may not, they are not uh, conscripted into the class and uh, it is not um, um, uh, incumbent on them to um, to listen the way you are listening. But if they can just get one or two or three parts of the messages, it will be good. The hunger in their hearts will bring, um, will make them want to desire to hear more. Um, so we'll be talking about the Melchizedek priesthood, and um, we centered on um, Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 5. That was where we closed on downwards, reaching downwards a little bit, I think, till 7, 8. And we're talking about the fact that since God had not subjected the world to come, Unto angels, uh, he has given it to the sons of men. For one in a certain place said, Who is mine that thou art mindful of him, not the son of man, that you visit him? Uh, you, have made it a little, you have made him a little lower than Elohim. So God has given the age to come. He said he was speaking this about the age to come, which is their message. The message of the apostles was the age to come, or is the age to come. Now, not so that they could experience another age. Um, it's like saying the apostles want to go to London, not so that they can enjoy themselves. No, but they know that this is the reason, and this is the timetable of God. This is the reason for Jesus' death, um, passion, death, burial, and resurrection. And they also know that this season of the age to come must happen so that the redemption will be fully installed. Uh, in humanity and among humankind. God has a timetable. Uh, Jesus Christ came in the middle of the ages. That was 2,000 years ago. And um, um, the, it was already um, uh, the end times, even as at that time, God's calendar was um, counting and um, God was um, for about to start folding things. up. And we want to show to his apostles that things are going to be folded up soon. So they were looking at that age to come, and um, it, was, it was their great desire. And apart from looking at the age to come, um, they were so desirous of that age that they began to look into the lifestyle of that age to come. Actually, that's what we're being taught. The, the church has been here for 2,000 years because God has been making us, um, you know, uh, to learn the culture of the age to come. In that age to come, there will be righteousness. Hallelujah. There will be righteousness. Uh, it will be the reign of the sun. The reign of the sun. And the reign of the sons. That's what uh, the apostle Paul called the manifestation of the sons of God. That all humanity have been growing up until now because they're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So, um, so, uh, what's going on is that they have been preaching this age to come, and I said they desired it so much that some began to experience the past of that age. You could see uh, Philip um, appearing, I mean, disappearing from somewhere and immediately appearing in another place. Uh, you could see the, uh, the raising of the dead. You could see, 
um, the quantum power of divine life manifest in the body of Saul when his cloak was taken and it was cut into pieces. It's as I say, handkerchiefs were taken. Say, and God wrote special miracles to the hand of Paul. You see that in Acts chapter 19, in so, uh, so much that handkerchiefs were taken from his body and were laid upon the sick. Now, Christianity or the life of Christ, if you allow me to use the word Christianity, I know a lot of people are. Uh, are averse to the use of the word Christianity presently. But the life of Christ, the ecclesia, what, what you want to call it, is a supernatural way of life. And so we have been learning that way of life and we've been trying by every means possible to make sure that we conform, our minds are conformed to the principle of that life uh, because it is a life of the age to come. The age to come is God's set time towards the full liberation of mankind. Mankind will be fully liberated from the hands of Satan. You see, the only people that are liberated presently uh, are the believers. And even believers are not yet fully even liberated. We're only legally liberated. A lot of people are still under sickness, under disease, under oppressive regimes, under poverty, under great, I mean, evil infections. And then you now have the entire world, unsaved world, completely under darkness. And then you now have nature. Even nature would be saved. Hallelujah. The, the, the price of the redemption, uh, the effect of the redemption is very high. It is very, very powerful. So we need to understand and know that. Praise God. You know, that um, re redemption will need to be installed uh, on all creation. We are, first of all, in the church. Yes, it started 2,000 years ago with the church. Uh, and then God was installing the program in our minds. But eventually, it's going to the world. The worldlings will begin to get liberation. But the worldlings' liberation will come through the church. That's why it says in uh, um, Romans chapter 8 that the old creation was groaning together, has been groaning together until now. Even we also have been groaning so that we can come into glorification. Praise God. So the, uh, the, the, sister, uh, rather, the creation is groaning and even we are groaning so that we can come into the fullness of the liberty that Christ has provided for us. When we come into the fullness of that liberty, it is called the manifestation of the sons of God. We'll begin to manifest as sons of God. You know, we'll, we'll, when I talk about um, when I talked about sonship the other time. Now, this uh, um, uh, so so it, when we get into sonship means to know the ways of the Father and to be able to do the same even when the Father is not there. That's what Jesus Christ said. He said the Father has committed all judgment into my hands. So and then of course we are His body. He's made to sit down there right now until we to whom is committed all judgment from the Son to us because we are sons co heirs with Christ and so that. Um, the footstool of his feet will be placed upon the, the nations. Hallelujah. That's where we're going. Um, <clears throat> so we said that Jesus Christ, now, uh, if you look at that Hebrews in chapter 2, you will see that um, the only problem with um, mankind to come into that um, level of authority of governing the new age, because man, not angels, would govern the new age. The be what type of man? It is not natural man. It is man as God made him. Hallelujah. Uh, because the full extent of man is actually Christ. When God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, he was not looking at Adam. He was looking at Jesus. He was looking at Christ. Hallelujah. You see, because Adam was partaking of the fruit of the tree, which was in the midst of the uh, of life, which was in the midst of the garden. He was partaking of the life of that tree, and he was continually partaking. You know, because um, we know that that tree has many fruits. And um, um, it, it, when you look at it from the perspective of Genesis in chapter 2, you will see it as if he had just one, or one fruit, the tree of life, the fruit of life. But by the time you get into... Uh, um, Psalm chapter 1, Blessed is the man who walketh not, who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Um, but the delight is in the, lay of, in, the way, in the law of the Lord, and in his Lord does he meditate day and night. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bring forth his fruit in his season. You know, so his fruit in his season. So we know that this fruit may be more than one because it has seasons to it. It just shows that it has seasons to it. By the time you get to Revelation in chapter um, 21, 22, you will see that the, fruit, the, the trees uh, are many and they are planted on either side of the, 
of the river of life. And they bring forth 12 manner of fruits. Hallelujah. They bring forth 12 manner of fruits. So, um, um, so you know that Adam was actually on a journey. We didn't know how many fruits Adam had eaten in the garden towards becoming Christ, you know, because he was not, uh, was not perfected by immortality. Because if he was perfected in immortality, uh, God would not have said, lest he take forth his, his hand and, uh, to the, uh, and eat of the tree of life and 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 die no more and and has and have immortality you understand so um uh, and, and so so he, he subject that man that god first made could die if he went wrong uh, but once he put his hand upon the onto the tree again after that sin he would not be able to die so god shut that place and shut that place down by the cherubims um there's a lot of understanding to get from there. Oh, I guess we'll get there in this uh, series of teachings and lessons. Now, so uh, the, the man, I said all of that to say this, that the man that God wanted to create was Christ Jesus and not Adam. He started with Adam, but Adam was on a journey to Christhood. Adam eventually did not f- fulfill, finish that journey. So that, that place was blocked to man. And then we can see that in the law, uh, from the um, the tabernacle uh, pattern, we could see also in the temple pattern, the temple of um, uh, Solomon and the tabernacle of Moses. We could see that because uh, the holy place, which has uh, curtains around them, um, uh, you know the the holy place. When you entered into the holy place, you know you have the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of all. When you entered into the holy place from the outer court. You come into the place that's built with curtains. It was not built with um, cement and blocks, uh, so it was built. With, it was built with curtains, and on the curtains were uh, uh, angel. One angel on this side, okay. One angel on this side. One angel on the other side, and then they spread their wings, and the wings met. And then before before they embroidered that, they embroidered it upon the curtains. Before they did that embroidery, there were trees and fruits, trees and fruits, trees and fruits everywhere, signifying that this is a garden. God was saying that this is a garden. The holy place is a garden. So uh, the angels were there locking their wings together, telling us that that place was not accessible uh, at that time under the law. Now, but what does that garden mean? It signifies the church because the outer court signifies the, the law age and the holy place signifies the grace age and then the uh, holiest of all signifies the kingdom age when God will tabernacle. Now it is that kingdom age that we're going. That is what the scripture talks about. That when it talks about the um, the age to come, the age to come. Paul refers in, in, to it in, in Hebrews chapter six. Uh, he talked about the age to come. He says some have tasted the powers of the age to come. Hallelujah. They have said the good word of God. And even of the powers of the age to come. So, uh, in the time of Paul, people have tasted of the power of the age to come. You see, what we have known presently, uh, very soon we're going to be knowing God in real terms. What we have known God to be, even in the Christian church, is a ritualistic religious God. It's, a, it's of the ironic order. This is what we're going to be dealing with today. But God actually meant to be known in the Melchizedek order of priesthood. This is who we are. Now, it, we have come to know God as a ritualistic God. Okay, come to church. Everybody, let us clap. We are here again. We are here again. Father, we are here again. Holy Ghost, come and take control. Thank you. I know that. And we have our liturgies. We have our, our own formats of um, increase. In our own kingdoms, so maybe you start with an ordinary brother as an ordinary brother as your title. And then you you move when you know more of the of the uh, the tenant tenets of the denomination to which you belong to. You move up a little bit, and then um, you may become a a Sunday school teacher. From a Sunday school teacher, you become a deacon. From a deacon, from being a deacon, you become a maybe uh, you get an appointment as the head of the ushering unit or whatever. And then from there, you become a a deacon. Then you become a, then you become an elder. Then you become a pastor. And then so in the midst of that. We, those who observe, those who see, those who observe, and in the minds of everybody in that denomination, in that church, you are growing. But meanwhile, what we are growing into is just the, uh, the stature of our denomination. Not, we're not growing into Christ. You see, because God's yardstick is different from the yardstick of man. God's yardstick is to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The yardstick of man 
is to uh, is according to denominations. If a brother has been very faithful, he has always been coming to church and he has been he has learned to behave the way the pastor behaves. He has learned to talk the way the pastor talks. Maybe he also has some anointing, uh, or maybe the same anointing of the pastor is upon him. People are going to take special interest in him. But he may have each. But you see, the way man looks is not the way God looks. He may be growing in the tenets of the denomination or in that Christian circle or gathering to which he belongs and to which he identifies, with which it identifies. But that doesn't mean that he's growing in God. Now, also in the larger body, um, you have pastors. A pastor just starts, he's suffering. He's suffering to start, just most like a, a businessman is suffering to, to, uh, to give pace, make sacrifices to grow his business. You know, it's a universal law. You know, it's part of the growth stage. So he's suffering, he's living in uh, uncompleted buildings. The guy just came to Abuja and he's living in uh, uncompleted buildings. In the evening, he will go to do evangelism. He has something in his mind. There's something he's chasing. It may actually be the will, I mean, the, the, the love for God. You understand? Uh, I, I'm not saying that everybody started with the aim of getting something materialistic and all that, but he has, he's, he's growing. He's growing. And then he's uh, going out, doing evangelism, coming back, no food, nothing, you know, and then uh, he's struggling. And then before you know what is happening, a family joins and identifies with him. And then they begin to uh, minister to him. And then another family joins. And then another family joins. Then 10 families joins. Then one day he brings, he, he gets a, a, a breakthrough to bring in a bigger minister who has a, a, a who is a known name in the local area. And then he's, many people recognize, oh, that man is doing a great work. And then with time, the more, the, maybe 30 people, call, 30 more families join. By that time, it begins to grow in leaps and bounds. And then one day, somebody with a, a lot of money comes in and then the, the ministry is taken. We get a land, you know, we get a land and then we build something, a superstructure, powerful structure. And then before you know what is happening, the whole city knows him. He has now, he has about 2,000 families, not 2,000 individuals, 2,000 families, People come in, you know, and all that. And then it's grown. Then we say, wow, this is a son of God. You see, that is what we see in the present order. But you see, the order of Christ is not like that. God has used this present order. for uh, it, uh, God always uses everything to his purpose. Even Satan will be used for God's purpose. Praise God. You know, when Satan does anything, God makes all things to work for the good of those who love God. We didn't know better. I'm not saying not to do all of that, if that's what we know. But see, that, um, the, see the, 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 the growth of God is different. The growth of God is when that man, when he wants to tell his story, will now say, you know, I came to this land. I didn't, I just came with one, one, nine, one back bag. That's where I put all my clothes in. I came to this land with that. I came with just one box of clothes. See what God has made me now. This is not uh, apostolic Christianity. It may look very shiny. It may look very powerful. It, it may have a big building. It may have cars now. It has suits they cannot count. That's not apostolic Christianity. By apostolic Christianity, I'm saying that's not the, the, the order of God. This is not the way God started Christianity. This is not this is not the life of Christ. It's a measure of that life, but it's not the fullness of that life. The church has been managing with that for a very, uh, for very many years, decades and millennia now. But God is shifting things to the real thing. Hallelujah. And this is where we're going. Now, in that Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5, when we read downwards, we now see that um, they said that uh, Jesus Christ had to partake of, of death be, uh, for all men. He had to partake of death for all men. What does that mean? Uh, so that he through, the, he through death might destroy the power of death. Hallelujah. And set those who are uh, all their lifetime free, uh, in the fear of death, set them free. Praise God. Now, he had, because death is the only thing that is preventing man to, uh, to come into that place of rulership, in the age to come, to, to be able to rule in that age to come. So in order to bring man into that place, God sent a human rep. The rep is Christ. And then he had to taste death for every man so that we won't need to taste death anymore. And so that we could, um, uh, we, so that we could come into the place of rulership because the, 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 the major thing about our salvation, the ultimate expression of that our salvation is that we come into the place of the rest of God. That rest of God is the millennium, it is the millennium, uh, uh, season to which the earth has come at this time, to which the world has come at this time. So he took that and the scripture now refers him, uh, refers to him as our high priest. 
Praise God. We have to say he had to take all of that and he went into the veil. A new concept was brought to the discussion we've been having before. Let's try read. <clears throat> Now, the Bible says that for <clears throat> it is clear that he does not uh, reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham, Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers. He had to take flesh and, and, uh, and uh, uh, blood on. He had to be like his brothers in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. Now, because... Uh, because because of that intent of becoming like us, so that he could uh, be able to un uh, he could understand us because he was not in the flesh, so to say, God understands us. Hallelujah! The Bible says in his in the afflictions he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence comforted them. Hallelujah! So God understands. But you see, Jesus had to come to flesh to actually live in the flesh. Uh, all right. So you know, God doesn't do God doesn't. Um, God is a God of principle. God does not say, I love you, you know I love you now, and then he will not still do what he says he will do for you. You know, so uh, even though God understood man in, as a spirit being, but he has to still come down to experience man. That doesn't mean that with the resultant effect of that experience, he could not get, but he still has to, he has to still come down. You understand? Uh -huh. So Jesus had to come down, and he became, the Bible says he became, um, he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people because it was dead that it was sin that brought death. So he had to be able to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Um, for since himself uh, was tested and suffered, he is able to help those who are tested. Hallelujah. So he had to become a faithful and merciful high priest. He had to become a faithful and merciful high High priest. That's the. Um, that's one of the. Uh, uh, that 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 is what was incumbent on him, imperative on him. He had to do that, and then that doing that makes him a high priest, so that he could uh, plead for the sins of the people. He can have mercy on them, so that he could lead us back into that place where Adam missed, and then he could also bring us to. Um, he could also bring us to. Um, the place where we can be reign and rule as kings. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, uh, so you remember that the entire background of the book of Hebrews had to do with, um, uh, the entire background had to do with um, uh, the Hebrew believers who were um, flip-flopping and who were beginning to doubt um, the tangibility and the superiority of what they had believed. Now, and uh, I said from the beginning that the, the, the law was made portrayed as higher uh, than the prophets. The law was portrayed that to be higher than the angels. The Lord was portrayed to be higher uh, here than Joshua in chapter 3. So you now, you know, that's in chapter 3, he entered into the issues relating to the rest of God. And, uh, you know, um, to the rest of God. Now, in chapter three, he said, "Therefore, but, uh, holy brethren, and um, and com and companions in a, in our heavenly calling, um, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession." So we see the second mention of the word high priest there. You know, Jesus Christ was the high priest of our confession. Now, one of the reasons why he is a high priest so that he could save to the uttermost everybody that. Uh, come to him. Well, I'm going ahead of myself. Um, now, so he became our high priest. That's what chapter 3 tells us. And uh, he said, if Joshua had given them rest, uh, then there will not, not be another time when um, rest needed to be given. Uh, and then he said, um, he said, uh, so that means if the Lord, okay, this is, let me explain it this way. Uh, he talked about divine rest in chapter 3. Um, and then he said, if Joshua, you see it in your King James Version as Jesus, but it's not Jesus, it's Joshua. Because the person that led them from the wilderness into the promised land, the promised land signifies God's intent, God's final intent for mankind. He said, if that was fi the final intent for them, for mankind, which was represented by the Jews at that time, by the Israelites, because they were the only people of God at the time, that if God had given them rest, uh, 
um, by bringing them into life. If that, if that was God's finality of rest, if that was what God was talking about relating to rest, he would not have promised another time in, uh, in the psalm, he say, uh, if you hear my voice, if they could enter into, I mean, they would enter into my rest. He said, because the first people that that rest was given to did not uh, enter into it because of unbelief. So what he's trying to say is that um, Joshua um, gave them rest, um, so to say, um, by bringing them into the land. You could have said they had rested. But later, after, well after they had settled into the land, the, a prophet, the psalmist, now said, if they could enter into my rest. That means there's another rest to the people of God. Please, can we know who those who are there? Let me greet people. Okay, Pastor Benga, God bless you. Dr. Edero, God bless you. We have Motaya Benson. Yes, Sabiola, thank you. God bless you. We have Joy. Who Joy, God bless you. We have Damiola Gabriel. Damiola Gabriel, God bless you. Thanks we for being here. We have Ajile. Ajile, you are in... Uh, don't you speak the Yoruba? You must show Ajile, yes? No, no, Dari. Okay, uh, Pastor Lulu. <coughs> yes. Daniel O'Gorfrey. Okay, Pastor Daniel. That's, that'll be all. Is there any question or anything put there by way of questions? No, okay. Please, <clears throat> we can prepare our questions if we have any questions along the line. All right. So, he now said that Jesus Christ... He it's breaking and skipping. It's breaking and skipping. Who said that? Uh, that's Moji Shola. Did you see Shola there or Sola? Sola. There's no H there. Praise God. Okay. Um, if it's breaking, check your network. Is, is it is it is it uh, is it disconnecting on the device? Does it disconnect sometimes and tell you that it's disconnecting? I'm asking you. No. Okay. So it may be a network. All right. We can continue. So <clears throat> praise God. Now, so he said, if Christ has given them. I mean, if Joshua had given them rest, there will be no other time that is spoken of that uh, if they will enter into his rest. Now, so Jesus Christ is the one that is targeted to bring down them that can, into that kind of rest. And then also uh, in the, um, Hebrews in chapter 4, he talks much, uh, a lot more also about the, the rest. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not um, harden your hearts. Now, so... In Hebrews in chapter 5, he now began to talk more about the high priest. You know, because Jesus Christ went on our behalf, he said in chapter 2, he said, he went into the veil, he was our forerunner, you know, who went into the veil. Um, he had to take, or, or, he had to take the, the, our nature on himself so that he could, he could partake of what we are, what things that were not allow man to reign in that world the sins, and then thereby deal with the death. He had to die so that he could deal with death. And so he became our high priest as a result of that. Now, the entire thing about the Melchizedek uh, priesthood is that God eventually now promised him that he was going to be um, a high priest. He says, um, let's see Hebrew, Hebrews in chapter 5. Now, in Hebrews chapter 2, we see the mention of him as a priest, as a high priest. In Hebrews chapter 3, we see the mention of him as a high priest. And that, that, those are two concepts brought into the book of Hebrews. Anyways, in any way, he was going to do that because um, he was trying to compare the Lord Jesus Christ with all that the Jews held there. So one of the things that the Jews held there in their culture and traditional religion was a priesthood. And it started with the high priest. Hallelujah. So he was talking about the high priest that Jesus Christ has become our high priest. Now, and uh, so let's read. For every high priest is, is talking about the high priest again in, in Hebrews chapter 5. For every high priest um, taken from among men is appointed in service to God uh, for the people to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, who are going out of the way, the King James Version would say who are going astray. Because of this, he must make a sin offering for himself as well as for the people. Um, no one takes this honor on himself 
uh, instead, a person is called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, the Messiah did not call himself to become a high priest, but one who said to him, you are my son, today have I, begot, I have become your father. You know, we talked about that in the, um, in the morning, when we talked about the fact that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, he said, and again, when he bring it for the begotten into the, into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. You know, and we talked about that was at the resurrection. And then we talked about Acts chapter 13, verse 33. Also, when, when the Lord, he said, he fulfilled the promise of the Father by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. In that, he said, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So that this day have I begotten thou art my son was a pronouncement, not of Jesus' earth work. It was a, pronounce, a pronouncement of the resurrection. Praise God. It was a pronouncement of the resurrection. Now, um, okay. He said, you are my son. So the one, so he's telling us here that because he's a high priest, <clears throat> no, you cannot just be a high priest. You have to be appointed. And it is a God, you know, because a high priest is primarily an intercessor. An intercessor here does not just be somebody who prays. Oh God, help. No, yes, he prays for us. Yeah. But an intercessor is a facilitator. Much, much like you call an agent today. Is, is beyond a prayer warrior, is a facilitator. Sometimes I can be called an intercessor with what I'm doing now because I am facilitating the life of God. I am trying to educate the people of God. Of course, I will pray for you so that you have more understanding. But with all that I'm doing, it is the ministry of intercession also. Intercession is not only prayer. Intercession is beyond that which is um, of prayer. Uh, he said... Um, Okay, so he said, nobody can just do it. You can't just come into um, an idol's or a, a god's um, temple and then just don their garment and say, you want, to, you want to be the high priest. No, he said, you must be called like Aaron was called. And it's in the same way, Jesus was called at the resurrection into the high priesthood state. Now, you are my son, this day I have become your father. And also said in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say So the one who called him as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, you know, the next verse says, during his earth walk, in his days in the flesh. So he knew that this, this, this calling to be Melchizedek, into the Melchizedek office was not during... His earth work. So that's why in the next verse he said, in, who in the days of his flesh, because he was a priest even at that time, that he must have something to offer. Uh, he offered strong cry, I mean, some crying and tears unto God, who was able to save him from death. And it was heard in that he feared. Hallelujah. So um, we're looking at two types of priesthood here. He mentioned the priesthood of Aaron, and then he's talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek. He said Aaron was called and Jesus was also called. But you see, he said that Jesus Christ um, was called after another order. And then he said, he, somebody said, I mean, uh, he that said to him, the father said to him, um, uh, again, he said two things to him. You are my son, this day have I begotten thee at, at the resurrection. Then number two, he said that thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is where um, we begin to dig into the priesthood of Melchizedek more and more. Now, uh, the, he began to talk about the priesthood of Melchizedek. He said, Melchizedek was without father and mother. If you read chapter 6, chapter 7, I mean, I mean chapter 6 talks about uh, some deep things that I would like us to uh, fully also grasp. He said, but he said, this Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. The, his, his, uh, his, um, uh, his name and um, his description had two meanings. King of Salem means king of peace. And then Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Righteousness and life are the same. And they are as a result of the resurrection. You understand? Now, uh, righteousness not in doing right per se, but in, in the nature, the essence of rightness. The essence of, uh, of rightness, of headship. That is, um, uh, that is a king. He was, he was a king of righteousness. So now, you will see some of these discussions as we go on Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 8, probably in, uh, into Hebrews chapter 9, and all that. And when he began to talk about Melchizedek. So he began to tell us that 
Melchizedek, and I like you to listen very well, very, very well. Probably listen to this part that I'm going to be talking about from now on again and again and again. Now, this Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. Now, that was the priesthood under which the Aaronic order, um, sorry, the, the second one was in the Aaronic order. We have the priesthood of Melchizedek, and then we have the priesthood of Aaron. The Aaronic priesthood was the priesthood under which the Jews operated. That was the highest class of, um, of personality uh, under the Jewish religion. And it was the way they accessed God. It was the highest point of the accessing of God. But it was a... Um, it was not a priesthood which uh, could bring in life. It, it, because men died. Each priest, high priest would die. And so they couldn't continue continually. And then, you know, it began to talk also about the fact that like, Jesus Christ brought a new law. And then a new law must mean that there must come a new priesthood. Uh, okay. Now, so the priesthood of Jesus Christ was not named after the ironic priesthood. So God, but God must legalize it. So, uh, because he was a priest, he must be legalized. Otherwise, he would not qualify to minister to God's people. So, God now referred back. There's something in law that you call precedence, in jurisprudence that you call precedence. There must have been a precedence. Now, for example, if you cannot find a law, or maybe you can even find a law, a statute, uh, an article of the law that supports a particular principle, um, whether you can find it or not, but if you cannot find it, it comes to your rescue. This thing I'm going to talk, uh, talk about comes to your rescue. If you cannot find it, but you have seen a precedent, that means a certain judge had done a pronouncement of like, like issues that you are now facing, that you cannot find a law to back it up with. You understand? To back decisions up with. What the judge can do, or what the lawyer can protest about, is that uh, my Lord, uh, I remember in um, uh, Onyororo versus Lagos State Government, uh, 1952, whatever, 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 this was the same type of case. This was the way the, the judge uh, took it in the lower court, and then they did not agree. They went to the higher court. Um, uh, the the, the, uh, the people being accused did not agree. But, and they, they kept saying the same thing, the lower court, the higher court, and even they went to the Supreme Court. And this was the judge, the Supreme Judge upheld all the, all the courts, I mean, all the decisions of the lower court and the higher court was up, uh, upheld by the Supreme Court. You know, maybe God of Appeal, I don't know how all of, all of those things play. You know, so this lawyer can say, can appeal to the judge and say, because of this, sir, my Lord, you must, um, grant us this kind of judgment. That is called precedence. So God had to look for a precedence. Not that God had to look for, because he had prepared, really, I'm using human language now. So God had to look for a precedence for the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was not born of the tribe of Levi. For it is certain, the book of Hebrews says that from Judah. God must bring, you must find a way of, um, of making, of legalizing the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And then there was once a priest like that in the book of Hebrews in chapter 14. The book of Hebrews, uh, rather, the book of Genesis chapter 14, rather. A priest like that. His name was called Melchizedek. The first place we saw Melchizedek was uh, in Genesis in chapter 14. When uh, uh, Abraham was the slaughter of the kings, and as he was coming to the king, the Bible said, he met Melchizedek. Please be there so that you can be sure it is. I'm not speaking to the air. That's why I say you should have your eyes there. Okay. Please have your eyes there. When you try to reconnect, just let me know so that I won't be speaking to the air. Yeah. Praise God. Ah, uh, I hope I was not, the, the cutting was not too, for a very long time. Wow. So as, uh, as I was talking about the, the, the priesthood of um, uh, Melchizedek, that God had to uh, establish it on a precedence because there had been a priest like that before this time, the priesthood of Melchizedek, um, um, that this Abraham met this guy who was coming from the slaughter of the kings. And then as he was coming from the slaughter of the kings, um, he brought bread and wine to Abraham, and Abraham gave him tithes of all. 
Now, this guy that was called Melchizedek was, uh, the book of Hebrews goes to say that he was without father, he was without mother, he was neither with uh, end of, beginning of life nor end of life, but abides as the son of God. This is talking about immortal life. Now, Paul drew out certain issues from there. He said, this man has immortal life. So he came forth from immortality. He came forth from, from eternity. Well, like uh, a, a pre-incarnate um, type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was a physical king. Now, one very good thing about Melchizedek is that he was a king at the same time as being a priest. He was a king priest. He was a king priest. Now, um, and then he was trying to talk, Paul was also trying to talk about the fact that the priesthood of Melchizedek was superior. He spent a long time talking about that in the book of Hebrews, that the priesthood of Melchizedek was superior to the priesthood of um, Aaron. The Aaronic order or the Aaronic priesthood was much more of religion. It was, uh, he, went the, he went to liturgy, he went to the service, he went to sacrifices, he went to all of that, but he did not have any rule over um, man, um, what we call the secular realm. The priesthood of Aaron did not uh, administrate over secularism or secularity or the secular or the, or the area that we call um, the, the, uh, the society, the human society. If you came to the Jewish culture, if you were, came to Israel in those days, what you see, and you are looking for the high priest, you will see the high priest in the temple. He never left the temple. There were... Uh, in the law, I don't think there were so many opportunities for Aaron to leave the temple. That was the priesthood of Aaron. But you see, this priesthood of Melchizedek, if you were looking for Melchizedek in Salem, you, you go to the throne, you will see him upon the throne. He was a priest who administered the lives, the political life, the social life, the educational life, the music of the people the, um, that they listened to and they enjoyed, the education they subjected their children to, that their children went to, the rites of passage in society, the road construction, the everything. Melchizedek was a king at, with executive order as well as a priest. So Paul was saying that if the priesthood of Aaron was the excellent priesthood that was unchanging, that could be unchanging, he said, uh, if, the, if, the, if, if the priesthood of, um, um, of Aaron was it, God would not have told, spoken again through David that when he was talking about the Messiah in Psalm 110, um, he said one of the qualities, one of the offices that David ascribed by the Spirit of God to the Messiah, to the Son of Man, when he said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make all uh, your 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 uh, your enemies the fruit of your, of your feet. He said, "I saw the Lord sitting." And the Lord said unto my Lord, "You know, sit down at my right hand and all that." He said he ascribed that um, um, when you read down that's Psalm one one zero. He ascribed those offices to um, the office of the or he attached it to the office of Melchizedek. Praise God. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ was sitting upon the throne. And I'm rather or standing before the Lord, and the uh, and the Father, the Father said, "Sit down at my right hand until I make the fruit, uh, the, uh, the enemy, the fruit of your feet, uh, 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 um, what do you call it now, the stool of your feet." You know, and then He said, um, "Thou art an high, uh, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek." Why am I even misquoting? Let's read um, Psalm one one zero. Let's read Psalm one one zero. I hope you got that something about what I just said now, related to the priesthood of Melchizedek, why it is different from the Aaronic order, the Aaronic priesthood. The priesthood of Aaron was limited to religiosity. It was within church. It didn't have anything to do with the outside world. It was within the tabernacle. Aaron almost never left the tabernacle. His pronouncement was about the tabernacle, and the Levites, who were among the people, taught them. They taught them the law and all of that. It was just about... Um, what I call religiosity. Um, but you see, the priesthood of Melchizedek is beyond that. Now, we're going to also talk about the superiority of Melchizedek over that of um, the Aaronic order of priesthood. All right. 
Now, this is very important because of the times we live in. Wow. Um, 110. Wow. 110. Yeah. He said, this is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your foot too. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Uh, rule over your enemies. I wish I had a King James Version here. I love it in the King James Version. It's, it's sweet. Uh, your people will surrender in, in the day of... Um, in, in, say, your people shall be obedient in the time of power. In the time of the days of your power. But this one puts it to say, the people, your people will surrender on your day of battle in holy splendor. From the womb of the morning, uh, uh, the dew of the, of your you have the dew of your youth. Now the Lord has shown, has sworn an oath, and will not take it back. Forever you are a priest, like Melchizedek, or like the King James Version says, "Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek." Now you know every Jew understood and knew that this was a messianic psalm. This was a that was why when 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 um, Stephen said. I see the Lord standing. I see the Lord standing at the Father's right hand. They, they moved towards him and killed him immediately. You know, because they knew that he was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and he was talking about him as the Messiah. <coughs> well, they knew that this is a Messianic uh, uh, um, uh, script here in Psalm 110. So, um, with the victory of the Messiah is attached the Melchizedek order. The Melchizedek uh, priesthood. Say, um, the Messiah will be of the Melchizedek priesthood order. Now, because, and that actually made him legal. That's what Paul was trying to say. And he's very truthful. You know, very, 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 very perfect. Because the Lord, the Messiah was going to be a king and a priest. And he must have roots. He could not just be a king and a priest without having roots. You couldn't just come and be a priest and a king. You, there must be precedence. And it's, it was certain that the Lord was sure that the Lord sprang out of Judah, of, the, of which there was no mention of priesthood. So that was why the psalmist said, Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So God had to go to Melchizedek, as it were, to root the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. To found the, uh, the, uh, uh, the priesthood of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now, and Paul was trying to say this. I'll actually come back to that and how it applies to us. Now, Paul was saying this, uh, that the priesthood of Melchizedek was superior. If you look, you need to read Hebrews chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. He said the priesthood of Melchizedek was superior to that of Aaron because of the encounter that they had in Genesis in chapter 14. Like I said, when Abraham was coming from the slaughter of the kings, when he was coming from the slaughter of the kings, uh, of, of the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, um, the, the, he came to rescue his uh, brothers and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, um, from the people who attacked them. You understand? So he was coming from that on that victorious um, uh, arrival, and then Melchizedek met him, and Abraham recognized Melchizedek as a priest of the Most High God, and he was a king. The name, the food, the, the meaning of the name is. King of righteousness, Sedek. The over uh, uh, the Sedek is actually uh, righteousness. The word Sedek, righteousness, you know. And Melchi Sedek means king of righteousness. Now, at the same time, it was also king of Salem, king of peace. You know, that's why by of the increase of his kingdom and of his peace, there shall be no end. Anyway, so so he said, Abraham, who was the father of Aaron. Gave tithes to um, um, Melchizedek. Now he said, when it comes to giving of tithes, I'm not preaching tithes here, please <laughs> don't let your mind go to tithes. We're explaining the spiritual principle which Paul estab established in scripture. Now, when it comes to giving tithes, I will not give tithe to my, as it were, my assistant pastor, as it were. It is my assistant pastor that gives me tithe. I will not give tithe to my church member. It is my church member. Let's just use that language for now. My church member that gives me tithe. So, therefore, if Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek, then therefore, it means that Abraham was less than Melchizedek. 
If Abraham was less than Melchizedek, it therefore means that Isaac was less than Melchizedek. If Isaac was less than Melchizedek, then Jacob was less than Melchizedek. If Jacob was less than Melchizedek, then Levi, out of which came the tribe, I mean, the, the priesthood, was less than Melchizedek. And if Levi was less than Melchizedek, then Aaron, who, is the, who was the first high priest, taken from um, Levi, who was taken from Jacob, who was taken from Isaac, who was taken from Abraham, running it backward again, is less than that Melchizedek. He now said the ironic order of priesthood is, is um, submissive to the Melchizedek order. He was trying to tell them that don't go back to Judaism because we go, we'll be going back to a lesser religious order. This, the Lord has said through the prophet David that concerning the Messiah, every Jew knew thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. They didn't understand how that was going to come. They didn't understand how that was going to be in place. The priesthood that they were functioning in was occupied by the sons of Aaron. So the Jews couldn't probably understand because we live after all of it had happened. So we can find out. We, we, we have the benefit of hindsight. But they were looking forward. Um, they didn't understand. There were so many things they didn't understand about the Messiah. That's why they killed him with their own hands. Because they didn't understand a lot of things. So he now said, the, the, the psalmist in prophecy has said, Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the Lord, having sprung up from Judah, God found precedence in a former um, uh, working of his and then located the Lord there. Now, the, the unique thing about the order of Melchizedek is that Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. Melchizedek was not a religious man <laughs> per se. It was a functional individual who functioned in society and he was also a king and he was also a priest. In other words, if you were to, like I said, let me repeat these words again. If we, were, if we entered into Israel, the territories of Israel in those times, you were saying, where is the high priest? They were going to take you into the tabernacle or if it was during the time of Solomon, they were going to take you into the uh, temple and they say, this is the high priest. And he lives around that area. He doesn't go out from those, that area. His functionality, his perspective, everything is limited to that area. Uh, so, but if you, if there was, uh, if you happen to go to Salem, where Melchizedek was king and priest, and you say, where is the high priest in this place? They were going to take you to the palace. And you're going to go to the throne. And you're going to see Melchizedek sitting down. And you're going to say, where is the high priest? And they're going to make, they're going to point to the guy. That's why David had to don. You said? Okay, it was off before. Oh, okay. Sorry for all of the backing and then offing. Uh, now, so you, need, you remember that David was also a priest. Praise God. He was also a priest as well as a king. In, uh, Nobody could question him because he understood that principle. In fact, the spirit led him to do what he did. He done the effort when he was carrying when they were carrying um, the ark into Zion, and he was dancing before the ark and dancing before the, he was wearing the priestly garment and the effort. And that was a Melchizedek priesthood. David was as well as, you know, even though he didn't function like that throughout his time alone. But you know that David had an inside life with God that, was, that made him a priest. He, was, he didn't function like other kings. He didn't, he didn't need a, well, of course, he needed the prophets and all that. He needed the priests and all that. But he, he, he functioned with a heart that was connected to God. And at the same time, he was a, he was a king. It was like, it was like breaching that place. But a king tried to do that. Asa. There was a king called Asa who took the incense, um, the censer and wanted to offer incense to God. And what happened? The Lord struck him with leprosy. Because that was not the, that was not the order. But David entered into an eternal thing. And then God allowed him to, to do what the Messiah was going to do. To be what the Messiah was going to be. Now, the Messiah alone was not the only one that was given the Melchizedek priesthood. We are of the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. You know the Bible says we are priests. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. 
We are royal priesthood. That is what actually royal priesthood means. It means Melchizedek priesthood because there is royalty to this, there is government to this, and at the same time, we are also priests of God. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that we are receiving from the Lord and executing in the earth. This is, the, this is what God wants for man. This is the ultimate of God for man and for divine government. God wants people who are kings and at the same time priests because they are the ones who can bring um, his reformation to the earth. These are the kings that will rule in the age to come. This is what God is trying to do. So what do we have today in the church? We have people who are perfect in church, who sing good uh, with good voices, who are shared with um, um, great air of service, preachers who preach well, and, uh, and all of that. But when we get into society, we become something as we join them. There, that is not Melchizedek priesthood. That is the ironic order. We, you see, uh, this is what I'm saying. Uh, you're listening to the word. You're so excited. The word of God is blessing you in church. You're sitting down there. Uh, but when you get to society, you don't bring that same word. Uh, you don't make it a practical experience. You don't, you don't, you, 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 give, you have learned to give room for secularism. That's not Melchizedek priesthood. That's not the priesthood into which God has called you. God has not called us into church order. Church order is ironic order. Church champion. Oh, the man is great in the church. He's great. He's powerful. He can heal the sick. He can raise the dead and all that. That is ironic order if it is, if it's all limited to that. Hallelujah. You must be able to, um, be king in the world and as well as a priest unto God. This is the Melchizedek order. Praise God. So in other words, you may be a pastor and you go to, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe, um, uh, you have a school. You don't make your school a secular school. That's the ironic order. You can't rule with God. You have to. You have to. You have to bring the government of God in that into that place. You you are not looking at the as the law of the land to do your school. You are looking at at the law of God. You are bringing the law of God into society. And let me tell you this: if you bring the law of God, you are already living above the law of man. <laughs> Did you get that? Because you know what is the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. If all you do is love your neighbor as yourself, they can't, they, you can never afford the love of man. Although uh, we live in a society that is crazy. You know why that, you know, this is the reason why we need to do, uh, to come into the Melchizedek order of priesthood. Um, now, 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 now. It is imperative of, on us to come into the Melchizedek order of priesthood. Now, 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 now. So that we can combat these people who, who want us to allow gay, gay rights and all of that. You know, because uh, we can't allow that. I can't allow that in my school. If I have a university, I cannot allow that. That is not, that would be the ironic order. I will be a churchman, but I cannot, I cannot bring the government of God in my sphere of influence. I am a churchman, but when it comes to corruption, I cannot bring the government of God. You know, when, that's one of the reasons why the church had not changed society. You know, because we have a people that are all, their minds are all locked up to the ironic order. And they steal money from the secular and bring it to church. That's an abomination. That's not how to rule. They are wicked to people on the outside, but they come show love and great, great um, air of service in church. They do not. They do not help the poor. They do not do justice. You know, when they lose their parents, um, they take all the inheritance alone to themselves, and um, they leave their brethren poor. And they don't share anything with them. But they are very well known in church. That is the ironic order. You are limited. You don't, you, don't bring, uh, you don't bring kingship into society. You have to bring kingship. That The ironic order is the only one that is just religious. Hallelujah. And even when you look at the ironic order, what God actually wanted the ironic order to be was the Mekhazadeh priesthood because there was a crown. The ironic order should wear a crown. Although it looked like a turban, they call it a crown also. And it was written, holiness unto the Lord, separated unto the Lord on his forehead. Praise God. So, the ironic order um, is different from the Melchizedek order. We must understand the Melchizedek order of priesthood so that we can 
function rightly with God in the present um, time that we are in and in the age that to which we have come. Because it is the Melchizedek order of priesthood that we rule this age, this age that to which we have come. That's why you see that there are people that we call Illuminati and all those guys. Those guys don't care whether you're a Christian or not. They want to just bring out their ideas. They have been supporting gay rights, the leftists or the globalists, whatever you call them, supporting gay rights, telling you what to do, close church, do this, do that. They, they tell you the kind of education you must put your children through. They tell you the kind of law you must obey. They tell you the kind of evil food you, call, you can't eat. This is what God made the Melchizedek order of priesthood to be. They are lawgivers. Hallelujah. They, they, they are, and they receive the law from God. I'm not talking about, of course, Ten Commandments are yet. I'm talking about legalism. I'm talking about the, the, the attitude of God, the nature of God. You know, the nature of God. You can't find God lying. That's the nature of God. You know, because I know a lot of, a lot of Christians are very averse when they hear law. People don't, people think grace is against law. Grace is never against law. The person giving you the grace is a straight guy. He's straight. It is his nature. God can't lie. God cannot commit adultery. God cannot commit fornication. God cannot kill somebody on just, you know. God doesn't do all of those things. So it's his nature. So that's even, it's a given already. You don't, it's not something you begin to even argue about. So we are the lawgivers in society. We cannot be lawgivers in society except we have the mentality of the Mechizedek priesthood. I'll round off on the Mechizedek priesthood tomorrow by the grace of God, and I will commence the next subject tomorrow by God's grace. And um, do we have any questions on the platform? Are there other people that have joined us on the platform? I've already mentioned being gone. Yeah. Okay, don't worry.